Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma barahabati fillah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continue on in our study of Usul al-Sitta The six uh, fundamentals We were talking about ikhlas which is the first usul that Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned and we left off where uh, Sheikh Alama Zaid Al Madkhali, Rahmatullah Ali, Rahmatun Wasi'ah, where he uh, said, So this is perceived as something from a riya. He's talking about showing off and, and this relationship to ikhlas, because the first usul uh, from the Sitta usul is ikhlas, is sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going to talk more in depth about the uh, about uh, 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 ikhlas and its meaning. So this is perceived as something from a riya, showing off or vanity. And when the servant intends an evil objective, or he desires to be praised by the people for recitation, or prayer, or charity, or jihad, or da'wah, or other than that, from the acts of worship in which it is obligatory to have sincerity towards Allah alone. This is a very powerful statement and I've been looking for a way to introduce the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is the most appropriate time. Uh, in an authentic hadith, I believe it's in uh, Muslim, Qala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إِنَّ الْأَوَّلَ النَّاسِ يُقْضَى عَلَيْهِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ رَجُلٌ مُسْتُشْهِدَةً فُؤْتِيَ بِهِ فَعَرَّفُوا نِعْمَهُ فَعَرَّفَهَا قَالَ فَمَا عَمَلْتَ فِيهَا قَالَ قَتَلْتُ فِيكَ حَتَّى أَسْتُشْهِدُ حَتَّى أَسْتُشْهِدُ قَالَ كَذَّبْتَ وَلَكِنَّكَ فَعَلْتَ لِي قَالَ هُوَ جَرِيءٌ فَقَدْ قِيلَ ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِهِ فَصُحِبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ حَتَّى أُلْقِيَ فِي النَّارِ uh, the Prophet والسلام, mentioned in a very long hadith, he said, amongst the first people on the day of judgment who will be uh, judged is a man who is brought forth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a, a, a martyr. And he will be asked, so what did you do for me? Meaning, what did you do for my sake? So this is why the relevance to ikhlas, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَا عَمَلْتَ فِيهَا قَالْ قَتَلْتُ فِيكَ حَتَّى اُسْتُشْهِدَ I fought for your sake until I was martyred. And then Allah will say, you lied. But rather you did it so that the people would say, you were brave. فَقَدْ قِيلْ And they said it. فَسُحِبَ لَوَجِهِ حَتَّى وَلْكِفِنَا Then he was dragged in the hellfire uh, on, on his face. And the second one, a rajulun ta'allam al-ilm wa'allamuhu wa qara fi ta'allam al-ilm a rajulun ta'allam al-ilm wa'allamuhu wa qara al-Qur'an qala fama amalta fi fama fama amalta fiha qala ta'allam al-ilm وعلمته وقرأت فيك القرآن قال كذبت ولكنك فعلت لي قال هو قارئ وأن يقال هو عالم فقد قيل ثم أمر به فصحب على وجهه حتى الكف النار وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the second man who was brought before who will be brought on the day of judgment. According to this hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is a man who read the Qur'an, like a half of the Qur'an. How many hufad do we have in the Ummah? Kathir, many, many, many. And how many hufad do we have that are recorded, you know, Abdul Basit and people who, who love them, you know? But all of them have to be idni now. Those that are living, be sincere. And those who died, Allah yarhamahum, needed to be sincere. And I'm sure all of them had to fight within themselves to fight against Riya, fight against showing off, because the shaitan is ever vigilant, and he runs through your veins. So, this one will be bought 
brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and asked for what did you do? And he'll say, I read the Quran and I taught it. And I learned ilm, you know, I, I, I learned knowledge. I, this is the talib al-ilm, this is the alam. And then Allah will say, will say to him, you lied. But rather you did it so that the people would say you were an alam. And you did it so that the people would say you were a qari, you were a beautiful reciter. And the, 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 the deep part about it, faqad qil. And, this, and it was said. Meaning it was said about these people that mashallah, so and so he's a beautiful uh, he's a beautiful reciter. Mashallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, so and so is a is an alam. He has so much knowledge. Allama so and so. Allama so and so. Mashallah, he's our Sheikh in the West. Sheikh so and so. Sheikh so and so. Wallahu Mista'an. Faqal and so the one who did this to show off and to be heard by the people to get one million YouTube views and whatever else, whatever their, their intention, and this is according to the intention of the individual. May Allah protect us from it. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. That it will be said. So then they got their praise in this life at the expense of the hereafter. In the hereafter they go to the Nar. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَقَلْ قِيلْ ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِهِ سُحِبَ لَوَجِهِ حَتَّوْ الْكِفِ النَّارِ And it was said, and then they, he was dragged into the hellfire by his face, on his face, by his forelock. حَتَّوْ الْكِفِ النَّارِ Until he was in the fire. وَعِيَادَ <clears throat> بِاللَّهِ And the, the third one, وَالرَّجْلٌ وَسَعَ عَلَى عَلَيْهِ وَأَطَعَهُ مِنْ أَسْنَافِ الْمَالِ كُلِّهِ فَأُتِيَ بِهِ فَعْرَفُهُ النِّعَمُ فَعْرَفَهَا فَقَالَ فَمَا أَمَوْتَ فِيهَا قَالَ مَا تَرَكْتُ مِنْ سَبِيلَ مَا تَرَكْتُ مِنْ سَبِيلَ أَنْ تُحِبُّ أَنْ تَنْفَقَ فِيهَا إِلَا أَنْفَقْتُ فِيهَا لَكْ قَالَ كِذَّابْتْ وَلَكِنَّكَ فَعَلْتَ لِيَقَالْ هُوَ جَوَادٌ فَقَدْ قِيلْ ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِهِ فَصُحِبَ لَوَاجِهِ ثُمَّ أُلْكِيَ فِي النَّار The last one and according to this narration of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the man who was a spendthrift and he will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will be asked what did he do and he will say that I did not leave مَا تَرَقْتُ مِنْ سَبِيلَ أَنْ تُحِبُّ أَنْ يَنْفَقَ فِيهَا إِلَّا أَنْ فَقْتُ فِيهَا لَقْ I didn't leave a way of spending any way of spending except that I spent it, spent it on your behalf for your sake this is what he said, and that's a beautiful claim to be blessed with wealth and spend it in every cause that you can imagine. Building masajid, helping the fuqara and the musakin, in the cause of da'wah, setting up marakas al-ilm, setting up this, setting up places to study, helping the, the people to learn to study, helping the people strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the various ways that you could spend in khair. And it was said, and so the meaning the people they praised him. Mashallah, so and so spend on this. He bought this building. Let's put his name on it. Let's put his picture over it. So and so did this. He did this good. He did this good. Mashallah, he got the praise he wanted because he wanted that was in his heart. That was the niya, the intention, and that's what went away from ikhlas lillah subhanahu wa taala. So then this one will be dragged in the face, then thrown in the fire. And because the Prophet ﷺ in this narration used a different level. So, Ahabitifillah, the lesson is, and the relevance of this, this hadith, is it shows that sometimes people can do the greatest deeds in Islam. What's greater than being martyred in the cause of Allah. We know all those ahadith that if one is martyred for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's guarding their property, whether it's free in Masjid al-Aqsa, whatever the case may be, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen, for the sake of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, then this person, uh, this person, you know, this is one of the highest uh, forms, you know, for highest deeds you can do. And you'll receive, you know, high levels in paradise. But rather, the people who did this very deed, it shows those shartain, those two conditions for amal, ikhlas and mutaba. Maybe these people had mutaba. They followed the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and striving in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then they, they, their intention was wrong. 
It was to show off. It was a, you know, to be remembered. It was to be videoed of his martyrdom. It was to be videoed. That, that was his intention. And he is thrown in the fire for such a great deed. The same with the, the alam. And the same with the one who spends. So it shows us, Ahabit Tafillah, to beware of Riya. Beware of showing off. And beware of uh, doing things to gain fame. Especially anything related to ibadah and worship. And may Allah protect us from it. I mean, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika and ushirika bika wa ana a'lamu astaghfiru khalim al'alamu. Then the Shaykh said, he said, and also from the manifestations of this is that which is uttered upon the tongues of some of the common people from their statement. If it were not for Allah and so and so, then such and such would have occurred. They connect the person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it were not for, for Allah and so and so, it is as if he is associating so and so with Allah for the blessing or excellence that must be attributed to Allah the mighty and majestic or for the adversity of the trial that has been removed from him. It is as if he is saying, if it were not for Allah and so and so, the task could not have been completed. Or if it were not for Allah and so and so, my need would not have been fulfilled. And other than that, from the statements in which it is not permissible for the servant to associate anyone along with Allah, the blessed and exalted. So the correction of this statement. So here the Sheikh is making bayan of the correct way to say something because we know people help us. We know pe people help us and people can be the reason after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, kulli shay bi qadrillah. Everything by the, 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 the Qadr, the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his knowledge of the Qadr and his, his creation of everything and our actions and all, all of those uh, aspects of the Qadr and Allah's ilm, nothing escapes him, his, his knowledge and that everything is written. Those are the maratib al-Qadr, those are the levels of the Qadr. All of that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The correct statement the Shaykh mentions he said, it's not permissible. He said, so the correction of this statement is that the servant should say, if it were not for a law, then so-and-so, then so-and-so, so the person will be the cause, and the law, the mighty and majestic, will be the fulfiller of the need, the remover of, of the uh, alleviator of the difficulty, and the averter of the adversities, and the trial. So, the, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in control. So you say, if it weren't for Allah, then so-and-so. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used so-and-so to fulfill that need. You know, that was almost a vehicle to, to have it done. Like, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the religion. He preserved it in Allah al-Mahfuz, the Quran. But likewise, he preserved it on the tongues of men through those Sahaba and those after them who preserved uh, the Qur'an. And so this is the sabab, you know, this is the reason, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's, it's Allah, then so-and-so, or then the uh, people who memorized the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve the Qur'an. And then the Shaykh mentions, and also from its illustrations is the statement of some of the common people, whatever Allah wills and what so-and-so wills, or whatever Allah wills and what you will, or so-and-so, as occurred in the first illustration. So when that was said to the Prophet, والسلام, he replied, do you make a rival to Allah? Rather, it is whatever Allah alone wills. This is very important, this hadith of the Prophet وسلم, because... It's not that the sheikh was just coming out of nowhere because some of the people who are maybe not as strong in practice and not as well versed about their the religious text, the nasus, then they'll say, why, is, why are you making a big deal if I say so-and-so is the reason this happened or something? You know, it seems like something light from especially those of us who come from other cultures, meaning we have a jahiliya, we have a life prior to Islam and, and the ways of talking and ways and cultural uh, things norms. It seems so strange. Why? It seems like a big deal. But we have a nas. 
We've texted the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show us how serious it is and our religion. It comes from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's how we, we understand uh, and that's how we uh, take our intiqad, our creed. So this is why we have, have that nas. So then the Shaykh said, so the will is the will of Allah, the blessed and exalted. As for the will of the servant, then it is subject to the will of Allah. So whatever Allah wishes will be, and whatever he does not wish will not be. Okay, this is the ultimate divinity. That it goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ultimate decree. This is in connection to the first principle which actualizes the Tawheed of Allah, the blessed and exalted, with all of its categories and issues, along with freedom, bara'a, from shirk, with all of its categories and illustrations and freedom from its people. Since Tawheed and Ikhlas are not complete except with freedom from the opposite of that, and that is shirk, uh, with Allah, the blessed and exalted, with all of its illustrations, meaning in all of its various forms. Stated, uh, Shaykh al-Islam uh, Muhammad ibn Dohab, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, and the majority of the Quran consists of an explanation of this principle from various angles with speech that even the most uh, idiotic of the common folk can understand. Then the Shaykh mentioned in his treatise the causes for ignorance. So this is the reason people become ignorant of this very important usul or all of these usul. This very important asl, min hadhi usul. He said, uh, Sheikh Zayd, rahmatullah alayhi, rahmatullah said, meaning ignorance became prevalent and its causes were widespread. And the causes for ignorance include the, uh, the scarceness of upright scholars, meaning ahl bid'ah, scholars of bid'ah, had to become widespread. Scholars of the book and the sunnah and the abundance of those who outwardly appear to have knowledge and are described with it, whilst they are not qualified for that. SubhanAllah, this is a, a very uh, important indictment, in fact, uh, to be wary of following those people. They may appear to have something of knowledge or something, but in fact they could be callers to the hellfire. They may be very popular, but in fact they could be callers to bid'ah, and that which leads us astray, wa'iyadhan billah. So this is a very serious, uh, serious uh, point that the Shaykh is mentioning, and the dangers of losing the ulama and then being replaced by the people of ignorance. And in this time especially, not just because we're losing many of our el elders, and some of them are, are very elderly in age, for example, the Mufti in Saudi Arabia, even some of his speech, you can see the change even in the past year or two. You know, you can see his health. I listen to him on the radio often and you can tell, you know, he struggles to breathe he's, and his speech has become more garbled because he's elderly and his health is, is not as it was. So we're losing a lot of those, the Rasakhun of Ilm, these major scholars, these pillars, who can really help us hold things down. Because often what you have, sometimes you even have scholars that are on the Sunnah, they're from Ahl Sunnah, or callers that are from Ahl Sunnah, but they have more mistakes. And they sometimes can fall into Hezbiyah, and they can fall into all other dangerous traits. And this we see this all the time, and I can just only tell you without giving you examples, my experience, I've been in Saudi Arabia almost 14 years, 15, something like that in my life. And I've seen many things and seen many scholars. And I've seen the elders and I've seen younger scholars. And I've seen mistakes even from certain elders and others, you know, but you see the Rasakhun, those major mountains of knowledge, especially the major scholars, as they say, the Kibar. Because they're not Kibar just because they're in age, but it's their elm and their fiqh and their derasa and their way of teaching. And the way they raise the people up, the, the society, and raise the community, and raise the students up. They raise them. Rabbuna. To Rabbuna Nas. They, they, they raise the people with an educative effect. And those who don't follow that asloop can sometimes, they make many mistakes and it can lead people astray. Because the people aren't getting the proper tarbiyah. They're not learning what is most important for them. They're learning about issues of takfir and how to make tabdir someone instead of learning basic aqidah more, focusing more on aqidah. But instead, new Muslims in, in lands around the earth are learning about one or two principles of jarwa ta'adil, but they don't know anything about the science. 
They don't know anything about anything, and they only know what's been translated for them. So this is a, a part of that danger that we, that the the, the many heads of of, of uh, the appearance of knowledge has appeared, but very few that are really uh, raising up the people to have the educated effect as the Rabbaniyun, or Rasakhuna fil ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions throughout the Quran. And then the Shaykh, he said, he said, this is either because such a person has knowledge, but he is afflicted with deviance. You know, he's a mubtadiya. So he deviates from the truth due to personal interest, or he is ignorant, but he raises himself up to the level of the scholars. SubhanAllah. Look how, Jazallah khairan, Allah yarhamuhu, Shaykhana, Shaykh Zaid. Uh, because this is a very important thing. So he said for two reasons that this is a danger and that these people can be a danger. Uh, that this two ways that the people um, that we have two ways that certain people are deceived in trying to resemble the scholars, believing they're scholars. Either one, they're actually ignorant. They're ignorant and they uh, prop themselves up to be someone they're not, to say, yes, I'm a scholar, come back to me. You know, they call to themselves. This is the awesome, this is one of the usul of Hizbiya. Calling to yourself, you know, only take from me. You know, I'm praising myself, this and this and this. These kind of, uh, these kind of, you know, I am the Salafi, I'm the only one. These kind of things, wa'iyadun billah min dhalika. So this can be from Jahil. And putting yourself out there when you shouldn't be, when you should know your ability and, and be on your level. There's nothing wrong with teaching, even if you have a little knowledge, but it's on your level. Stay within your, as they say, the common statement now is, uh, st stay in your lane. He said, then the second, the second group is the people that outwardly uh, resemble knowledge, and they have knowledge, but the, actually their desires incline them towards bid'ah. And I can think of a particular da'i da that I've mentioned countless times, who the people refer to as a sheikh in the West, uh, who fits exactly this, I believe exactly this, because this is a man who studied with the ulama here in Saudi many. This is a man who studied in secular education, well-educated, but subhanAllah, he fights Salafiyya with his, his statements. He fights the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah, when he knows it. He knows. He he doesn't have the excuse of ignorance in many of these affairs, but rather he chose the the tariq of popularity and and other things which distorted and clouded his vision and other reasons that only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows why individuals like that would go astray when they are muta'allimin. They they've they've learned. They know and they illustrated that they have some strong knowledge that they could benefit the people with. Wallahu musta'an. May Allah protect us. I mean. So then he says, so he commands and prohibits. He delivers religious verdicts and teaches upon ignorance and misguidance. So this one harms and does not bring about benefit. And he carries the burden of that. It's sinful. Because it is inevitable that teaching must come from knowledge of the book and the sunnah. And whoever is not like that, then he will not benefit the people. He will only harm them. SubhanAllah. That is a scary warning for us to be careful, to be cautious. Uh, sometimes people ask me questions that are, and I either I will ask a sheikh or I just say, please ask someone in your locality who, who knows, who knows about these fairs. I don't know. And I, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna even begin to step out there. I'll tell you what I know, because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, فَسَلَ أَهْلَيْ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. And there's nothing shameful in not knowing. That's the thing we, we have to humble ourselves. There's nothing shameful in saying Allahu Alam. And I'll tell you a story. I've related this many times in the dars of Sheikh Abdul Musin al Abad, our, our Sheikh, Allama, Imam, in Medina. And it was in his dars, I believe it was in Sunan Tirmidhi. And I remember the question, somebody asked a question, it was about an issue of Tahara. And the ulama have ikhtara. I think it was about breaking the wudu. Uh, the one who uh, meaning the one who touches their private parts for example like after a shower was that mess or was something else and I thought for sure I said I know this answer I've studied this studied this with different mashayik and I've studied this in the books I know this and I so I thought to myself this and then the sheikh said Allah Allahu A'lam 
this imam, this elder, this who's the one who's known for be of the Rabbaniun, be idnillah, because this is how he teaches. He's been raising up students for I think 40 years in the haram or 50 years in the haram of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's been teaching there in that chair. Allah you have the whole. So it shows us habatifillah that there's no shame and being humble, but unfortunately some of the people they answer every question that comes their way, halal, haram, halal, haram, with no, with no shame and with ease. She's, she's divorced. Uh, this is a khula, I'll give you the khula. This, this easy, and some of the students have gotten in trouble for that in the past, that some of them may weren't even known to be really students like that. And they were making these fatwa, and they were doing all kind of things like this causing marriages to be dissolved around the earth. So how will a person like that go before Allah? The one who feigned knowledge because they may not have intended to put themselves up there. We don't know their intention. But they were making fatawa bi ghayri ilm. Making, you know, making uh, uh, fatawa without knowledge and without the right to do so. Without the prerequisite level of knowledge. Without the, that's out of your field. Stick with this or stick with this. Stick to your level. And that's a difficult thing for us to do and may Allah help us all. I mean, you know, I mean. Then Shaykh, uh, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn al-Duhar rahimahullah ta'ala said, then when there passed over the majority of the ummah, whatever passed over, shaitan made apparent to them ikhlas through the manifestation of belittling with the righteous and neglecting their rights. Uh, then Shaykh Zayr Rahmatullah said, This is an aspect from amongst the aspects that are befitting for every student of knowledge to complete. That is because the one who belittles the righteous scholars, criticizes them, and describes them with that which they are free from, then he has been afflicted with the disease of doubt and the disease of lust. And the distinguishing sign of the people of innovation was that they would find fault with the righteous scholars. So Sheikh Zaid, he said that this was a sign that even throughout history that you will find that Ahl Bid'ah and some of the common folk would fall into Bid'ah by belittling the scholars. And I tell you all the time that, you know, I have this experience all the time with many individuals, perhaps they could be colleagues I work with, who don't. You know, they have the benefit of the language. Maybe they're Arab, okay? But their knowledge of a lot of the Masail, you know, they, they tend to always go to politics. And they don't have knowledge, but you'll hear them talking about ulama'ina, about great scholars, our great scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, saying the same criticisms that they heard from either the people of Takfir or the people of Tabdir or other people. They just say and, and make these statements with ease off their tongue belittling the ulama, and this is a very dangerous thing, because once you reduce knowledge and reduce the value of authentic knowledge, then the people will take, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ru'us al-Juhal, they will take the, the heads of ignorance as their, their, their scholars, and look at, the YouTube is full of it, look how many people, they don't even think they're making fatwa, women, men, every persuasion, Every orientation in the religion, making fatwa, uh, for example, on YouTube or, or any of the social media, just saying anything, you know, and then there's du'at that are well, well established that, you know, that they, if they only stayed to their level because they weren't students of knowledge, but Allah gave them popularity and ability to, to convince Christians and others to embrace Islam. That's a beautiful gift. We don't fault them and we only help them would support them because they're good in that. But they should not make fatwa and go outside of that when they're making big, big mistakes in a soul and iman, issues of iman, issues about the Quran. Why? Because of jahil. Because they didn't study. They didn't study the book of Allah. They didn't study the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah and they didn't sit at the feet of the scholars. So, of course, bal wiyudin. They will cause guidance I mean, cause misguidance, and they are misguided. And this is a very serious uh, and dangerous thing. Then the Sheikh said, what a distinguishing sign. Uh, they mentioned in the footnotes some very beneficial statements showing that this was something that even the Salaf 
had to deal with people who belittled the scholars. Stated Abu Hatim al-Razi, uh, uh, who died in 277 Hijra, Hijri. He said, the distinguishing sign of the people of innovation is that they find fault with the people of narration, Ahla Ethar. And this is in, uh, you'll find this narration in Shar Usul al Itiqad li al Alakai. And then there's many, many statements uh, that illustrate this from the past, from the scholars of the past and the, the, the contemporary scholars. He said, What a distinguishing sign. It is possible for you to take it from the voices of those who speak with belittlement of the scholars and criticize, criticism of them with a statement. They are hypocritical flatterers, or they are immersed in the worldly life, or they do not have knowledge about the current affairs of the people, and whatever resembles that from that which is uttered upon the tongues of the people of innovation, who do not have any respect for the scholars. And the scholars are those who have a firm footing in knowledge, and they have long years of experience in the area of calling to a law, jihad in the path of a law, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, and advising the Muslims in their various levels other than that from the topics of knowledge and actions. So subhanAllah, you'll see, and in the contemporary times, we had so many hizbis, hizbi groups. We had, for example, the head of uh, uh, Ahya wa Tarath uh, in uh, Kuwait, uh, Abdurrahman Abdul Khalik, the statements he said about the ulama, Many of the ulama, the Rubbaniyun, that they're the ulama of Hayat wa Nifas. You know, they're the scholars of, of, of menstrual uh, periods and post, uh, post-natal bleeding. These kind of statements, because, and that they don't have fickle walk at, they don't know what's going on in the current affairs, that they this, that they that. And you see a lot of these same people that even if they might be scholars themselves to a level, that their fatwa causes fasad and hizbiya and enmity. And they make fatwa for things which are not legislated by Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. You find this often. Wallahu musta'an. And then he said, Therefore, the one whom we hear belittling the affair of the scholars of the past and the present, I am referring to the righteous Salafi scholars, then he is from amongst the people of innovation, meaning the one who's talking about Ahl Sunnah, the Salafi ulama, then this person, this is a person of innovation, la shak. And his defamation of the honors of the scholars who traverse the menhaj of the Salaf proves the corruption of his tongue and his heart. Since finding fault with the upright scholars is from the distinguishing signs of the people of desires, the, the innovators to whom shaitan has beautified their actions. So he has deviated them from the path of those who were guided. They were those who considered love for Allah and hatred for him to the strongest handhold of Iman, and they considered it from the best attributes of the obedient people. May Allah make us from amongst them through his graciousness and generosity. Indeed, he is the best of those who forgive and the most merciful of those who show mercy. Then the Shaykh mentioned as another subsection under ikhlas or sincerity, the, this asl, he said the ruling upon exaggeration concerning the righteous. So this has a relationship with sincerity because when you exaggerate with the righteous people, even if it's to a degree uh, that doesn't go to ibadah. It's a very dangerous thing and it negates ikhlas because you're giving people a level, either you've reached a level of where it could reach shirk and divinity, as some of the extreme Sufis do, or your takli can reach to a, a, a very dangerous level, which can actually reach to a level of ibadah and worship, but it can violate that sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala said, so he made apparent to them shirk with Allah in the manifestation of love for the righteous and their followers. Allama Zaid al-Madkhali rahimahullah ta'ala said, so shaitan made shirk with Allah the mighty and majestic apparent for many of the people in the manifestation of loving the righteous and their followers. This is ghalu, you know, this is extremism or exaggeration concerning the righteous people. 
And this is the reason for the destruction of the people. And they're becoming distant from the Sharia of Allah. And they're becoming distant from the sound Aqidah of Tawheed. It is that which the Messenger وسلم, said about beware of Ghalu, extremism, since those who came before you were destroyed by Ghalu for the righteous. So the, the communities before us, they, one of the reasons they were destroyed was for Ghalu, because they exaggerated their righteous people. This is how shirk began. This is how the shirk of the Christians, you know, began with worshipping, coming up with the trinity of Isa alayhi salatu salam, worshipping Isa alayhi salatu salam, attributing divinity to Isa alayhi salatu salam. So this is Ghalu, this is the danger of it. But unfortunately, many in the, uh, in the community of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went astray and began to practice those aspects of shirk. And this goes to a few ahadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Men tishabah bi qawmin fuhu minhum. Whoever resembles the people, he is from them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Let tattibi'oon sunnah min kana qablakum hudwa al-qudzati bil-qudza hatta law dakhalu juhra dhabla dakhultumuhu qalu ya al-yahud wa nasara qala faman. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said, You will follow the way of those people who came before you hand span by hand span, arm span by arm span, until they followed the, they until they went into the hole of a lizard, or even if they went into the hole of a lizard, you would follow them. And as we mentioned prior to this, a dub. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a dub. It's a certain kind of lizard which is very popular here. And some of the Bedouin tribes, some of my students, they eat the the dub and they love it. And they show me cook. They show me videos of them cooking it and ki catching it and things like this. And anyway, the, the, what's this resemblance that the Prophet ﷺ made, this similitude or this analogy, uh, is very, very powerful. Because the dhub, when you learn about the dhub, this special lizard, his hole is not like just many other creatures that just have a, a burrow. The, 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 the burrow or the hole of the, this dhub is that it, it, it winds. And that's why you can't just reach in and get it. Plus, he would bite you. But you can't, uh, you know, it's not just straightforward. His hole is very tricky, din, in the, in, the, in the earth, deep in the earth. So what the Bedouins do is they have to use a, a, a pipe. They take their pickup trucks and they smoke them out. They blow exhaust in there and then the dub comes out the other end, sticks his head up, and that's when they grab him by the head. Or they have other ways. Or they pour water down the hole because water is going to flush down the hole and they flood him out. This is how they catch them. The Prophet ﷺ said, Let tatib'oon sunnah min kana qablakum hatalo dakhalu juhra dhub la dakhultumuhu Even if they went into the hole of this bub, this lizard, you would enter it. Meaning said the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa or some from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will resemble the non-Muslim in the other nations, the nations that were destroyed before us, to such an extent that even if they went into the hole of this lizard, they would follow them. Knowing that the hole is, is, is difficult and that it, there's no benefit and so forth. And subhanAllah, we see it daily. We see it in the, 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 the way the youth are changing, in their dress, in their language their music, everything that they are taking on that they see from the West. You find that in many of the Arab lands, but in many of the Muslim lands, it doesn't matter. It's not restricted to the Arabs, but because I live in these lands, I see it on a whole other level. Even the femininity, even the all kind of stuff, Wallah Musta'an, and I could write a book about it, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and our brothers and sisters. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbil alameen. Even tattoos, which is so strange in the gym. I find, I find Saudis, tatted up a little bit. Those who probably win it. And I'm shocked that they would even just be in their society like this. It's just, I've seen so many changes in 14 years in Saudi Arabia. Wallahu Musta'an. So Wahhabit Tifillah, this shows us we would follow them. And we would follow them in every way. And that means even in worship. And, and this is a real story. I had a, uh, an individual approach me, a Saudi, who's, who asked me, what is your proof about God? What is your proof that Allah exists? And he wasn't testing me, he was actually, he was testing me, but he wanted to debate and argue about it because he was not a Muslim. I was shocked in the land of Tawheed that there's communities of people like this who are atheists.
والله المستعان لا تتبعون سنن كان قبلكم you will follow the way of those who came before you then Sheikh Zaid rahmatullah alayhi he said so shaitan may shirk with Allah the mighty and majestic apparent for many of the people in the manifestation of loving the righteous and their followers and so then he said therefore galu concerning the righteous is not a sharia legislated path it is either a path of the people of major shirk or it is the path of the people of innovation and misguidance who have deprived who have been deprived of the aqid and iman with its correct meaning so the sheikh also mentioned he said that you will find the people in their resemblance and their exaggeration their resemblance to the people of shirk and their exaggeration by exaggerating the righteous that they will say they will get to such a level that so it is to exceed the boundary in loving them so this is what is meant by ghulu and by having extreme love it is he said it is to exceed the boundary in loving them and raising them above the level that Allah the glorified and exalted granted them for that where that which no one has the power to grant besides Allah is requested from them, such as those who request, request the awliya, close allies of Allah, to fulfill a need or to alleviate a difficulty or to grant a child of noble breed or the bestowal of sustenance or the removal of a calamity. They call upon them and seek rescue with them and hope for them and hope for that from them. And they believe that this claim of love and high esteem for them, that it is recognition of their status. So this is a very powerful claim, and, and we'll get into this in the other usul here, that this is actually the hujja of these people, of many of the people of, uh, of shirk, who uh, say la ilaha illallah, that they worship their saints, they worship their dead, they worship the, the graves of their saints, they say their sheikh, uh, as we mentioned, many uh, uh, forms of shirk where they supplicate to their sheikhs, they, they have the humility before their shaykh as they should for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as they should, even to the extent of the humility that they should have before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in prayer. So this shows us, Ahabatullah, the danger of ghulu, that it leads and it destroyed the people from before us because of shirk. It got them to shirk. And that's what our ummah is faced with. You'll go to many of the lands, you'll find that there's uh, huge graves just like the Christians and the Jews have. And that the people venerate the saints within those uh, tombs and graves. And you'll find in some of the Masajid, there are graves. And you'll find that as, uh, as I mentioned prior to this, and likewise, Sheikh Abdurazak mentioned this. So this is even a whole different story. This I spoke with someone personally in Hadramaut when I was in Hadramaut and he was mentioned in the south of Yemen Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Badr Hafizullah Ta'ala I was listening to his Usul Sitta today and he related a very similar story he said that he was talking to someone and that they were mentioning that their uh, grandfathers in their village that they used to bring their you know when they were going when they got married their, the, their new bride, who was a virgin, they would bring her to the sheikh to be blessed. And the blessing came through him, uh, 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 you know, breaking her virginity. And then this is how, then there was barakah in the marriage. Then he would take his new bride and have a happy marriage after the sheikh is, has already tasted and tested everything. So this this shows you, it, this is so hard for us to, to even imagine how someone who says la ilaha illallah, if they read any of the text, how they could have gotten so far away from the meaning of that kalima. How they could have gotten to the level of shirk al-akbar and raising tombs. We have so many ahadith uh, that are very clear. And the ayat in the, in the Quran, the muhkamat, minhu ayatu muhkamatun hum umul kitab. We have so many ayat that are the muhkamat in the Quran that are very clear 
unambiguous ayats, it's very straightforward about shirk and what shirk is. And we learn that also from the details of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with the ulama uh, of the past, the sahaba, the tabi'een, the tabi'een, and those after them in righteousness, what they understood about the issue of shirk. We don't hear them exalting the saints. We don't hear them uh, worshiping the saints, supplicating to the dead. And all of these practices, which I wouldn't have believed when I was a non-Muslim that this was the religion of Tawheed. Because the religion I had left before, the Christianity, what was left of it that I practiced, or I didn't even practice, but the little bit of belief that I had in it, I never accepted Jesus as the Son of God. Even as a so-called Christian, I was raised in the church and I didn't believe that. So to come to Islam and then believe that some sh saint somewhere, and the Sheikh was also relating... Uh, the story about uh, how some of these so-called awliya, some of the places and some of the villages, the people are so ignorant, and they have these guys, they don't pray, they don't do any worship, and when the adhan is going, they're out there in the market laying down, and they just stay in their place, the people bring them money, the people bring, and, and you know, so-and-so, a person asked about, who is that guy, he doesn't ever pray, they said, you don't know, that's wali so-and-so. This is a, a true story the Sheikh related. It shows you how far people get away if they don't learn the religion and stick with real ikhlas. And you have to learn the, the religion to know what sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, know what shirk is, know what tawheed is, know what ibadah is. So that way you can stay away from uh, the muharramat and enjoin and do the wajibat. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.